Hi, I'm Jeff Mitchell. I'll be giving this talk with Jim Lambert. We're both engineers at HashiCorp working on Boundary. Um, we'll be answering questions in the Q&A cards down below during the talk, and also please join us for the live Q&A at the end of the talk. And with that, um, we're going to talk today about the underlying principles that drove Boundary's design, um, hence sort of what makes Boundary different, what did we think about when designing it, and then Jim's going to talk about how we translated those into Boundary's core architecture. Um, you know, there are a lot of entrants, especially startups in this market, but we thought that we had, you know, we could bring our experience um, working with the types of customers that we work with to bear and that um, it would speak to a lot of them. And so we put a lot of very careful design into Boundary and hopefully you'll, you'll see uh, what we mean during this talk. So, um, you know, a lot of core HashiCorp and especially vault design principles carry over, but this was a really good time for us to kind of take a step back and think like, okay, you know, five years after vault, what lessons have we learned? Um, what kind of principles can we apply? And generally pulling in not just from vault, but the rest of the company as well. Um, and so I want to talk about three of the principles that we had in mind. Um, they're, they're just three out of many, but I want to specifically focus on scaling, security, and open source. So for scaling, vault clusters run everywhere. There are home hackers running them on Raspberry Pis. Um, and then there are single clusters with many nodes that are processing trillions of transactions per year. And Boundary needs to scale up and down similarly. You know, we want to be able to make this accessible for the home user that is, um, you know, just wanting to get into their home network, um, but also that's capable enough for the largest business. So scaling the easy way. Um, so the easy way these days and kind of what would be viewed as like a very modern way is you pick a cloud vendor that has lots and lots of services exposed. You plumb together the services with a custom front end and you're done. And this works really well for a lot of products. Um, but, you know, you have to hope on your end that pricing doesn't change, that services aren't discontinued. Um, and it can help a lot of smaller projects get off the ground. But when you look at the scale of kind of the, the bread and butter of the HashiCorp customers and, and our open source users, um, there are real world complexities. Um, and so for especially larger customers, many of them will be um, are or will be multi-cloud and on-premises for a long time. Um, even if they're moving to managed services, you know, then they are so likely to have on-premises for a long time. Those managed services may be on various clouds. And that actually really matters because there are things like uh, geopolitical and contractual obligations that require, um, you know, the use of some clouds or not using other clouds. And so where your data transits and where it's stored and where the services are located ends up mattering a lot. Um, and we saw with Vault that there are a lot of like AWS centric solutions that didn't flourish whereas Vault did. And we think this is part of the reason why um, is that, you know, it's ability to run anywhere. Um, and on the open source side, you know, if you're a, a home user, maybe you don't want to sign up with, uh, with, you know, GCP or you don't want to sign up with AWS to run something. So you can't necessarily rely on those cloud services. So scaling must be a core part of the system design, and it applies both to, re you know, request per second style scaling as well as organizational scaling. So security, um, a core vault focus is accessible best practice uh, security. So we want to do what's secure and not what's easy. And at the same time, try to remove a lot of the complexity of being secure from the end user. Um, boundary follows suit. We build on, on kind of our experience of the vault to go further. Um, so here are some examples of, of things we've done. So TLS management. So connections and boundary um, between the various components that Jim's going to talk a bit more about later on, uh, controller, worker, and client, are protected via single-use mutual TLS authenticated one dot, you know, TLS 1.3 stacks. Um, and doing so re significantly reduces both the ease of compromise as well as the risk of exposure if compromise occurs. You can't you know, say, oh, I'm, I'm going to reuse this TLS stack across other sessions. We don't do that. Um, and we use key management systems, which can be Vault or can be various you know, cloud systems like AWS KMS or GCP CKMS or Azure Key Vault to provide the root of trust for secure introduction needs um, and to use those to protect these TLS credentials as we pass them around so that we can establish that mutual connection. Um, but, you know, to make it easy, like we, we are doing all that for you. We're doing this like modern and best practice security, but you just have to provide us with a KMS. Um, and that's it. So zero trust. Um, you know, Boundary has role-based access controls that apply to every resource within it. Um, we also have useful aggregates like type and wildcards. Um, but, and anonymous users are actually controlled the same way. So you can actually apply uh, RBAC to the anonymous user that doesn't have an authentication right now to Boundary. Um, but sort of thinking about, you know, how do we make this kind of easier for the end user? One of the things that we took back as kind of a, a principle is to not uh, to compose access explicitly from zero, real zero trust. There's no deny capability. So you can't grant a bunch of, uh, of permissions and then remove permissions later on. And the reason is we found this reduces a lot of cognitive load. It makes it much easier for people to figure out like, what are the final set of permissions that are applying? Because I don't have to think about what did I grant access to and then sort of remove specific access. Um, 
So it prevents accidental granting of excess privilege and reduces cognitive load. So again, taking something that's really complex and making it accessible and trying to reduce the burden on, on your end users. And as a final example for security, you know, we even lo looked at things down to like the workflows. And so um, one way that this panned out in, in Boundary is that uh, one of the KMSs that you can define can be shared by both an operator and the system itself. And so the operator can, you know, if they need to put passwords or API keys or something like that in config files for Boundary, can actually encrypt those values in those configuration files, which allow it to be put, you know, across uh, Git or in your um, CI system or, you know, baked into AMIs or containers or lambdas or what have you. Um, and, and, have that safely as long as the end system can access that same key mess for decryption at runtime. Um, so we tried to even just make it easier to be secure, but still simple um, if you are uh, you know, an operator and looking at the workflows. And finally, I want to talk about open source. So, you know, HashiCorp is founded on the open source ethos. We believe very deeply in it. Um, and there obviously, there will be an enterprise version of Boundary at some point, just like our other products. But like our other products, the core capabilities will always be open source. And you know why does this matter so much? Well, partly it's philosophy. Um, you know, we we build not just products but a lot of libraries. We put them out there. Lots of people use them and find them valuable in building their own you know their own uh, software packages. Um, and we use a lot of other people's libraries as well. And we deeply believe that we all benefit when you know more more and more of this is open source. It's also very practical. Um, you know, infrastructure is not homogenous. We know that very deeply at HashiCorp. Um, and so, you know, as examples, we're building dynamic host catalogs, which um, similar to like the static host catalog now, where you put in the hosts that Boundary can connect to, these will pull in hosts directly from cloud providers or, or whatever. But there's tons and tons of places that can host machines for you. Um, so we're working on the interfaces and we'll build initial plugins, but we know that we can't provide every plugin for every user. Um, and similar for credential stores, we're working on built-in vault credential sourcing right now, but we could support plugins in the future. And so, you know, having open APIs and open source is something that we see as very important because we want you to be able to build on what we were putting out there in order to support the things that you need, because we know that, you know, things are not homogenous. Um, and so that was my kind of very brief overview of some of the principles that, uh, that we have, uh, and that we used when building Boundary. Um, and Jim's gonna talk about core architecture and he's gonna talk about how we put some of that act into actual practice when building, uh, building the product. Uh, so take it away, Jim. Hi, just a reminder, my name is Jim Lambert. I'm a, a software engineer on the Boundary team. And like Jeff said, I'm gonna take a, a few minutes to talk about uh, how we applied the principles to our core architecture. So Boundary's architecture basically is a control plane and a data plane. And the control plane has controllers and it has KMSs. As you see in the, in, the, in the picture I have here, there are multiple KMSs for different purposes, but generally it's a KMS component and there's a database. That makes up the control plane. On the, on the data plane, there's basically just workers and a KMS. And that's the KMS that's shared between the controller, the control plane and the data plane to do authentication. So let me take just a few minutes to talk about the KMS component. The KMS component in the boundary architecture allows the customer to choose a root of trust. And we use that root of those roots of trust or that root of trust in a variety of different ways in the boundary architecture. One way we do is there's a recovery key. And that recovery key, of course, allows you to do rescue and recovery operations, of course. But you can also use that recovery key for just to authenticate for just about every operation within Boundary. We also have a root CAC, a key to encrypt keys. And from that root CAC, we will derive other keys, other CACs for uh, scopes within Boundary. And a scope within Boundary allows you to organize Boundary by projects or organizations. And so each scope will have a CAC and then it'll have multiple decks. Uh, so uh, keys to encrypt data. And, and so those decks will be kind of single purpose use within the scope, but that will just give you a sense of how we use that, that, uh, that root CAC. And then we have a worker uh, auth key, which is the KMS key that's shared between a worker and a controller and allows for the single stack uh, authentication for via TLS that Jeff talked about. And then, of course, Jeff also talked about the config key, which allows you to uh, encrypt uh, different uh, uh, attributes within the configuration as well. The controller component in our architecture, part of the control plane. That is really where the domain model for the most part is implemented. You'll see the domain model a little bit in the work, but primarily 
it's in uh, the controller. And in the controller, you're th you'll see things like users and sessions and targets and credentials and stuff like that. Our controllers are leaderless. It's a little bit different than uh, some other uh, HashiCorp pr products that use Raft. Um, so we don't have a Raft uh, running in our protocol. At least we don't have it yet. For, we're using the database for, for persistence and all that stuff. So controllers are leaderless and that allows us to have kind of predictable uh, horizontal scaling. Controller also does authentication and authorization. So it does authentication for users and of course for workers as well. And there's authorization for all the users via roles and grants and principles. The controller also serves uh, all API requests and it also serves our admin UI. And the controller, of course, assigns tasks to the data plane uh, and workers. The worker. The primary focus of the data plane and the worker is to proxy sessions. It will do other jobs that the controller assigns, but primarily it's going to be to proxy sessions. The database, the database component. Um, we're using a relational database under uh, uh, boundary and that gives us that predictable horizontal scaling of the controller. It also gives us predictable horizontal sca scaling of the data, uh, the database as well. And it's where all the, the domain model is persisted. Um, currently, we've implemented uh, Postgres as our uh, supported uh, database dialect. So I'm going to take just a few uh, moments to talk about the controller in particular. So we use dr domain driven design within boundaries uh, architecture. But we also have architectural boundaries, and those architectural boundaries are um, respected uh, throughout the controller. So you'll never see the, the services talking directly to the database or you know, the database uh, going all the way up to the service. There are layers here, and we, obey, we kind of obey those boundaries as the requests go through the system. Uh, you'll also find, because it's domain-driven design, you'll find ubiquitous language of the domain throughout all these layers. You'll also notice that there are proto buffs not only at the service layer, but at the data storage layer as well. So once you start down this domain driven design and boundary, you start to see the domain everywhere. Like it, it becomes part of your language, this ubiquitous language of a, of the domain, right? What's ubiquitous language? Ubiquitous language is where you strive to have clear concepts and terms without ambiguity across a limited domain, right? So this domain we're talking about is boundary. And you use those terms and concepts, whether you're talking to engineers or designers or product manager, whether you're writing an RFC or PRD or code or test, wherever you're using these terms, you need to have them consistent and, and unambiguous. And of course, we're always searching for new patterns and terms within the boundary do domain as we develop it. Just to talk a little bit more about protobufs in our architecture, we use protobufs for more than just API. Well, we use them for the API, of course, as well, but we also use them to generate our CLI. We use them to generate our SDK, our Go SDK. We use them for open API integration, the swagger stuff that you'll see from Boundary. And we also define all our database types in protobufs. Now, those database types also have some extra tags that we put in those protobufs to define like primary keys and the column names if they need to be overridden, perhaps defaults for the columns. But we use protobufs quite a bit within Boundary. So once we have those protobufs, especially at the storage layer, we can use them as we go down the architecture into lower layers, like the infrastructure layer. And the infrastructure layer at Boundary is composed mainly of two different parts. There's, there's more, uh, a few more things at the infrastructure layer down at that lower level of Boundary before you get to the relational database. But primarily, we have a database API which provides re retriable transactions, all the CRUD operations you would need in a database, query, lookup. It also supports something called an operational log or an op log. And in Boundary, an op log is an order history of, a, of every change that goes into the database. And that's part of our infrastructure as, as well. So if you do a database operation through our database API and you ask the API to, it'll generate an, uh, an op log for you and store it in Boundary's database. Now, each entry in the op log is encrypted, and it contains the serialized protobufs that were necessary to make that change. The entries are ordered, which means we had to do some kind of serialization for, for locking to get that. And so we used optimistic locking, which is kind of a known pattern to, to provide something like that for a relational database. Why an RDMS? 
Foundry has lots of related data, right? And, and a related data basically kind of screams that you want to use an RDMS because it makes it easy to query and bring all that related data together when you need to quickly. And so one example of that is when you authorize or create a session in Boundary. When you authorize and create a session in Boundary, you have to bring data together from targets, from hosts, host sets, host catalogs, auth methods, users, user tokens, servers, grants, roles, principles, all this related data has to come together very quickly, basically instantaneously, and so you can create or authorize a session. And this is just one of the many use cases in the boundary domain that maps really well to a relational database. How else do we use a relational database? Well, we also rely on a relational database to ensure the accuracy and consistency of the domain data. We define primary key and foreign key relationships with no orphan rules and normalization and constraints and a few triggers and of course transactions. And we use all these things because our prime, one of our primary database tenants is the database should not rely on the application layer to maintain its accuracy and consistency. We use this defense in depth kind of strategy across the, the infrastructure and the layered architecture where every layer will perform validation and, condition and integrity checks. And the database schema at the lowest level is just that last line of defense to make sure the accuracy and consistency of the data. Just for a minute, I'll talk about when you get down to the rational database and boundary, of course, there's a data model, there's a schema there. And this picture uh, is just a small sliver of that data model. It's basically the OIDC auth method that we just released with some of the other related data like the KMSs and the scopes that are related to that auth method. Now, if you look really, really closely at this small picture, you'll see on the far right, there's a base type of auth method. And just a little bit left of center, you'll find a subtype of an OIDC auth method. This is just one example where you'll see subtypes and base types modeled in the boundary domain in the relational model. Of course, for auth methods, we already have a password auth method, so that's another subtype in this model. Boundary currently has about 100 tables or so, maybe a few more, and has roughly 150 or so uh, foreign key uh, relationships defined and lots of constraints. Now, when I, when I kind of spout off that statistic, some people get really nervous. They're like, oh my goodness, that's a lot of complexity in the database. Well, the complexity really isn't in the database. The complexity is in the boundary domain. The complexities are there already. So all we're doing is, is using the constraints or the, or the features of the relational database to define very small individual constraints. For example, when we define a foreign key relationship between the user and the accounts of that user, and we define a no orphans rule, that allows us to know for sure that if a user is deleted, all the accounts for that user are deleted as well, and the database will ensure that integrity. So that's one example of how you can kind of limit that complexity and see that it's really just a bunch of small little things that have one single purpose that build up to protect the database. I want to take just a minute to talk about Boundary's best kept secret, and that's the data warehouse. It's not really a secret because if you look at our source code, if you look at our data model, you'll see there's a data warehouse there. And in our data warehouse, you'll find facts for sessions, and you'll find facts for all the connections that make up a session. You'll find dimensions for users and hosts and some dimensions for date and timestamps as well. And using a BI tool that you are familiar with, let's say Tableau, you could point Tableau at Boundary's data warehouse and you could start to explore patterns within access to different hosts in Boundary. You could start to understand, are people or somebody, or is there something going on where where some connections are being made consistently in off hours, which aren't the normal business pattern. And this data warehouse right out of the box will provide you that feature from Boundary. We have plans to enhance it, and of course we'll document it, and as we enhance it, and we add bytes up and bytes down for every connection, you'll be able to look for even data exfiltration patterns possibly. By using this data warehouse that's part of Boundary, you won't have to ETL it, design your own data warehouse, and understand all of Boundary's related tables to build a warehouse that's already in Boundary. That's all we have time for today to talk about, uh, in particular for Boundary's uh, architecture and how we built it up. And now I'll give it back to Jeff. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, and thanks everyone for attending our talk. Uh, we have time for some live Q&A, so hopefully you'll stick around and ask us some questions right now. We'd love to have them. Thank you very much.